Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you. Do you mind just in your bio? <laughs> I was looking at that. Go ahead and let yeah. it know yourself. <laughs> That's okay. I worked it into my, I always do. Uh, okay. When I'm uh, presenting to people, I let them know who I am so that they know why I'm doing what I'm doing. And um, I like to make sure people know my credentials. So it's not like you're just supposed to believe me. Um, <laughs> so thank you guys for joining. You're going to see me rocking a little bit. I am actually in a hospital right now in the room I am in. The lights shut off if there's not movement. So I'm not anxious. I'm doing it so that I don't sit in the dark while I present to you guys. So um, I apologize for that. Um, so I, uh, pr I prepared this presentation um, as a resource for CRC. So uh, the language in it is going to be directed toward people who have, um, you know, suffered concussions are recovering in the process, that kind of stuff. Um, so it'll still be beneficial for any professionals um, to see as well, but just kind of want to let you guys know that to begin with. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen so you guys can see my one presentation I have for you working on it in the hospital, which is kind of interesting. All right, can you guys see that okay? Can you make it full screen somewhere? There we go, perfect. Awesome, that that better? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, all right, let me see if I can. Okay, so I titled this the emotional roller coaster because I think if we've all, working concussions, you've had a concussion, it really is ebbing and flowing, um, not just emotions, all symptoms, um, but I think it's just, you know, really um, important for us to understand there's going to be highs and lows. Um, and so the first kind of um, part of this is uh, just a little, it's not really my bio, but it's a background about me. So, uh, you know, who am I and what makes me qualified to talk about mental health and concussion? So I'm a clinical psychologist um, that I, and I worked with concussion um, population for the past 10 years, um, but I also have experience with other neurological disorders. Um, my internship, my pre-doctoral internship, so my right. last year of my degree, my graduate degree, um, I was at Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan in New York City, and I worked in the rehab medicine department with um, their traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury units. Um, so I do have inpatient and outpatient experience with traumatic brain injury from mild, moderate to severe, um, and then working with physicians, OT, PT, and speech. Um, I will say uh, I'm in private practice now, and that uh, background is somewhat unique for private practice. A lot of the folks that um, I trained with and, and um, kind of went the same route as me ended up in the hospital setting. Um, and so uh, I do think there, there's a I want to acknowledge that because I do think that there is a lack of resources kind of in the private practice setting or out in the world outside of the hospital um, with psychologists and other mental health professionals who have experience in this um, arena. So I'm working hard to try and educate my colleagues and help them understand concussion um, as well. Um, I've worked with um, you know, leading neurologists, obviously, at Mount Sinai, but also kind of more in the sports world, um, but I'm doing some work right now um, with um, a professional league uh, players association. I've worked with neuropsychologists. I have background in neuropsychology as well. Um, so I'm not a neuropsychologist, but I'm familiar enough with the work and, and what they do to understand their reports and to do them myself if I absolutely have to, and they're not super complicated. Um, and then I just do presentations on concussion and mental health quite a bit um, in professional settings as well as in settings like this. Um, and then I stay up to date on my latest research. So I'm not reading, uh, to be honest, I'm reading a little bit of, of mental health research, but I'm reading mostly neurology, um, speech, OT. I'm reading all the other journal articles because I think part of what helps us learn and grow as, as professionals is understanding their teammates and who we work with. So um, my background is in sports, but um, that is not the only population that I see by any means. Um, and so I do have experience across the board. Um, and then I also have a history of concussion and that doesn't make me an expert and it doesn't make me someone that you should listen to, but it does help me in my work with my clients um, just because it helps them relate to me a little bit more. But my work is research-based. Um, so this is just a fun little thing, um, little comic strip that I saw that I, I think could resonate with people who've had concussions, right? That's like, everything's going to be great and it's amazing and filled with bunnies and rainbows and all that fun stuff. And then we have a downfall, right? And like awful and I'm failing and things are terrible. 
Um, and I know you guys have probably seen this, the providers, you know, people who are in concussion recovery that sometimes it's, we're on the upswing and sometimes we're on the downswing. And I think some of this is kind of typical human life, uh, but also when you have an injury in there, it can be really hard and as well. So what is the injury? So there's a lot of um, old lingo out there. And so I wanted to just include this um, because I think Kathy and I spoke about um, maybe making this a resource um, on the website as well, just for people to access. And so I wanted to give people a visual and understanding. This is a complex diagram. You don't need to understand it, but um, it's one of those like, it isn't a structural injury. And so, um, you know, to the point about legal cases being difficult, it's because we don't have a test, right? Like there's nothing we can do to say like, yes, there's a concussion or no, there's not because it's not structural damage. It's something happens, right? We have enough energy to the outside of, you know, our head or even, you know, head and neck, whatever. Um, our brain gets disrupted. And then now there's this energy crisis. And for the first seven days, there's higher risk of re-injury because your body's trying to figure out what to do. So the, the injury itself is the enter is, is uh, at the molecular level. It's not structural. And a lot of people still don't understand that, um, especially a lot of psychologists, because that's not our wheelhouse. We kind of go with the old bruise brain kind of MRI. We think we can see things that we really can't. Um, and so I think it's really important for people who have experienced concussion to really understand that as well. Um, and that by definition, concussion should are supposed to resolve. We'll talk a little bit about the symptom trajectory, but um, so, you know, we all know this um, again, in terms of like symptom presentation, that is different than um, signs, right? So what we see versus what someone's telling us, two different things. So talking about symptoms in terms of the audience of, of people who are patient. Um, so, um, obviously we know all of these, so I'm not going to kind of belabor the point, but, um, these are the ones people mostly complain about, like I'm sensitive to light. I've got a headache. I feel tired, all the things. Um, I, I just don't feel right. Right. I feel slowed down. Something's different. Um, and cognitively we do use neuropsychological testing. Um, but the research is really, it's really mixed on whether or not that's actually helpful. Um, if I'm perfectly transparent. Uh, when we think about concussion, um, there's lots of different things that impact how we do cognitively. And uh, really the strongest research we have is that um, we have differentiated kind of processing speed um, and attention as being related to the injury itself, but memory as being more depression related. So when people have memory problems after they have a concussion, they're often thinking it's because of the injury. It is, but not because of brain damage. So those are like very distinct differences that if you know mental health providers are working with them with concussion, they don't understand that, they can unintentionally reinforce something that is untrue, which actually psychologically makes them worse. Um, and so this is why the understanding this type of stuff is really important. Um, and then this is kind of like the less talked about, right? So or thought about or, or, or you know, we ask about it, but do we really pay attention to it? Sometimes it depends on how bad it is, but, but sleep is huge, right? We all know this. Um, sleep is really, really important. It's also sometimes really hard to do when you don't feel good. Um, you have a headache or whatever. Um, so trouble falling asleep, drowsiness, I mean, all those things, I mean, that's going to make you also forget things and make your attention poor. Um, it's going to make your pain worse uh, emotionally. So more emotional. So people right? Lability. Sometimes I feel good. Most of the time though, I feel bad or I just feel really like at the drop of the hat, I could just yell at somebody. Um, so that irritability, sadness or depression, and then nervousness as well. Um, those are all things that can be, and I'll go over this here in a sec. They're multifaceted, but still related to the injury itself. So again, maybe brain injury related in terms of, um, the energy crisis may not be related. Um, Otherwise, though, it might be a situation, it might be um, kind of a, what's going on, um, pre-existing things like that. So um, these are important to look at, all of these symptoms are, but they're all, um, to the point of this slide, pretty nonspecific, right? So we don't have a test for concussions yet. We can't diagnose by a blood test yet. We're working on biomarkers. We're working on all the things. We just haven't made it there yet. Um, do, uh, there's been some neuroimaging um, that has been researched, but is not available to the broader public. So um, for practical purposes, there's no test for a concussion yet um, and no structural damage. Symptoms are subjective, right? So um, if I give someone who hasn't had um, a concussion, 
uh, the, the post uh, concussion symptom checklist, most people are not gonna have a score of zero. And so um, the symptoms can be related again to injury, but may not because a lot of the symptoms that we have are nonspecific. Um, and then as most of you probably know, there's lots of injuries that have similar symptoms. Um, so something that I am very conscious of when I'm doing an, uh, um, an intake with somebody or an evaluation on uh, someone who's had a concussion and they're worried about ongoing symptoms, I'll ask them if anybody has looked at their neck um, because so many times like the cervical spine is overlooked um, vestibular injury, all these things, they have overlapping symptoms. And so um, the differentiation is really important. Um, and I think treatment of concussion, especially in the mental health field, I'm not going to speak for anybody else's field, but the mental health field, um, and for the patient can feel so helpless because it feels like I have no control. My brain is just doing whatever. I have this brain injury and it's just doing whatever it wants. And like, I can't, I have no control especially if we don't find people like OTPT and speech who like know what to do with the symptoms and how to evaluate and figure out what's going on physiologically. Um, and so we have to really be mindful that there are other things out there that, you know, kind of look like concussion and may be concussion um, related, but it may not actually be brain damage, which is what everybody is afraid of. So obviously here's our treatment team and not everybody has this, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I wish everybody did just to make sure everybody had this evaluation from each angle. Uh, I put neuropsychologists on there even though assessment um, is a mixed reviews um, because a lot of neuropsychologists are still really involved and in, they should be. Um, it's not that they shouldn't, but they're really involved in treatment and trying to figure out how people are doing. Um, would you guys... Are you all familiar with like the impact test and stuff? Is that what, or do you guys use that? Or do you, is that mostly sports? I mostly forget what sports in the schools. Um, it's where you hear it. give it to schools, but nothing that we do, do or give. I don't think any of us here have given that. Okay. Do you, do you guys know about it or have worked with people who have taken it? Some of us. <laughs> I've done the training on it, but I haven't used it yet either. Okay, gotcha. Um, what did you say? Give a broad overview of what it is for some of the people yeah. who are shaking their heads, so they haven't heard of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the impact test is uh, it's a computerized assessment created um, out of UPMC in Pittsburgh um, to look at different areas of functioning that we, we traditionally think of as being impacted by concussion. So processing speed, attention, um, memory, things like that. Um, and so the idea is you have a baseline evaluation and then later you can go back in and test again. Obviously, if you're not in sports, that is not very um, practical, uh, but any changes are thought to be concussion related. Um, I think in theory, it's a good, it's, it was a good kind of thought process, but in practice, it's not been super helpful. Um, the reason I ask that though, is because um, if you haven't given it, you're likely going to hear of it if you work with athletes. Um, and you may also run into physicians who use it. Um, it. It's okay at getting some information, but really relying on it too heavily. Um, I would caution against, and I would just make sure that you understand what it's actually telling people because cognitively um, there's no effort measure on it. That's the biggest complaint that we have in the field um, is that people can sandbag it pretty easily, especially if you're talking about athletes. Um, so they can on their baseline intentionally do poorly so that if they get injured, you can't detect it because they're not going to tell you and their scores were already low. Um, but I, alternatively, they may not do that initially, right? Or you may have someone who is like, you know, doesn't have a baseline or whatever and just doesn't want to go back to sport or doesn't want to go back to work or doesn't want, you know, like not consciously, um, but not do well. And we don't know because there's no effort measure. So that's, that's one kind of, um, problem with it. The other is that neuropsychology in general is, um, we're not meant to do things very close together. That's not how the field was kind of created and operated. And so um, using it in this way has been come under some scrutiny. So I just want to put that on your radar too, because there's a lot of people who've had concussions who've had that um, test done and a lot of weight has been put into it. It's not that it's useless, but it just needs to be used in the right way. So um, 
I think OTPT speech, like those all to me, um, I can't reiterate to people how important those aspects of, of recovery are um, and treatment are and those um, you know providers are just so crucial to people getting better. Uh, mental health has not quite made the rounds until, until you get to post-concussion syndrome and we're now months out. And then now all of a sudden people don't know what to do with these clients. And so they go, oh, you should see a psychologist <laughs> because we don't know what's happening. Um, or we're doing, we've done all we need to do. And usually when I say people, I mean, it's usually more the medical side and medical uh, physicians um, and they don't, they're not quite sure. And so um, typically that's when people get sent my way. Um, and if they've done all the things, which normally they have not done all the things that are on this list, um, then that's the referrals that I, um, so problem being, if you work with a mental health provider who doesn't have this knowledge and experience, then they may not understand where concussion fits into the mix and like what part of the team, what team they're even on. They might not know they should be on a team. Um, so this is kind of a, just a chart I like, um, especially for people who are, um, who have had a concussion and maybe told things that are based in the old literature and now the new research. So the old way, and I still hear this all the time, and maybe that I because I live in Oklahoma, but um, I don't know if you guys hear this stuff still, but um, do I need to wake them up? No, we let them sleep. Like after a certain period of time, we know there's no risk of a bleed. That's why they used to have people wake up um, during the night just to make sure that they weren't um, having worsening symptoms. But um, then we thought, oh, you need to just rest. Rest is the best medicine. And then we realized, oh wait, bed rest, even if you're cognitively intact and not having any issues actually creates similar symptoms. So maybe we shouldn't have people just sit in a dark room and do nothing for days long. Um, and so now we kind of think one to two days kind of like of actual rest rest and then trying to get up and start to do some things. Um, no screens and no reading was kind of thought to be uh, what we wanted to do until we were asymptomatic, which probably most of you know now, more moderate exposures that thought to be best. So um, no school until symptom-free and obviously this is, says school, but work, whatever. Um, but we wanna start to like get people gradually resuming. Um, and when I get into the psychological components of this kind of more, you'll, you know, it'll make more sense, but um, I think you can kind of see why that would be a problem. And then no social activities. Obviously we need to have social activities. So we need to kind of make sure we have small social gatherings, make sure we're really engaged still with other people. Um, and then again, no physical activities. No, we need to be moving and up and running um, after a day or two just to get the blood moving. Um, so why is it such a roller coaster? Why is concussion so hard? Well, this is kind of what we talked about, um, I mentioned a little earlier. So sometimes it's, it is neurological. It's the injury itself. It's you know, trying to resolve itself and trying to get that energy crisis under control. Um, and so we have difficulties there for a little while. It may also be, you know, migraines um, or headaches or things like that. And um, neck injury, you know, it could be all those things um, that can make us emotional. Uh, it can also be situational. So those are the circumstances of uh, the injury itself. It could be the circumstances around the injury. So lot, losing our job, uh, being a human. Um, and then, you know, we need to acknowledge and kind of move through the emotions and reach out for support. But a lot of people don't, don't do that. Um, and then character. Um, I might qualify this not as character, but I would just say kind of personal variables. So like who we were before we got injured really matters. Um, and so... Um, there can be somewhat, you know, some people would say, I put in here victim mindset. Uh, I didn't put this in here, but I put this in here, even though it said that, because I think there is a misconception that that is a thing. And so I wanted to put it in there to point it out because I think it can be interpreted as a victim mindset. Like this happened to me. I'm so like awful, but this just to me is poor coping. Like we have poor coping. I don't know how to understand like what I do have control over and what I can make better. But if you think about someone who's kind of in that position pre-injury, then when you're in a concussion, like that's not gonna go away. And so treatment adherence goes down, um, hope goes down, mood goes down, symptoms get worse. And so we have to kind of think about these things. So again, all of these things are impacting emotion and they're all injury related. They're related to the injury. Um, it's just some of the pre-existing stuff worsens after the injury um, and then identifying where it's coming from is the tricky part. Um, so, uh, the psycho, uh, psychosocial consequences um, of concussion, right? It's invisible, right? Everybody's heard that, oh, but you look fine, right? I mean, anybody who's had a concussion knows that you hear that all the time. It's very annoying. Um, symptoms can vary um, across 
uh, each person and from day to day, right? So sometimes it's a bad day, sometimes it's a good day, that's normal human thing. Uh, but when it's concussion related, for some reason, people think that means that um, you're faking or it's not as bad as, as you say it is because you had a good day or a good hour depending on the situation. Um, being cut off from social groups um, can be really hard. Um, pressure to be normal and return quickly to whatever your responsibilities are. Um, and then the stress of not being able to do that uh, when we're not feeling well. Anxiety about recovery and long-term health, um, which I'll circle back to. And then uh, reintegration consideration. So how to come back, right? So it's not zero to hundred as, as we know as providers, but for someone who's had a concussion, like we need to know it's not zero to hundred. Like we need to gradually increase our workload. It's just like working out, right? So if I'm working out and then I'm not working out, then when I start working out, I don't start where I ended, right? Like I start <laughs> back where I kind of was to begin with and I work my way up. It's the exact same thing with concussions and our cognitive load, right? So if we don't do that, our emotions get worse, right? We can be in a worse emotional state because the stress goes up and we're like, why can't I do this? I should be able to, my doctor's telling me I should, people around me are telling me I should, like if we don't have appropriate care. Then psychologists, mental health providers, whatever, um, I think what I've seen the trend be is one or the other, either this person is not being truthful, right? They're exaggerating their symptoms or oh my gosh, they're missing it. They're not getting it. Nobody's paying attention. To, and it's like this overreaction um, because they feel this person's being invalidated and it comes from a really empathetic space, um, but is not ultimately helpful to the person who is um, struggling. All right, so have a disclaimer slide in here. Um, I'm very research focused. and I wanna make sure what I uh, present is based on research. Um, what I am going to present is informed by research. It is not based in research, okay? So what I mean by that is I've used my clinical experience and clinical judgment um, of what I've encountered and research about psychotherapy in general and you know uh, providers and things that happen um, and, and kind of come up with this like, some suggestions that are informed by research, but they're not research-based, they've not been studied, um, as, as just to give some guidelines for helping people understand how to look at mental health treatment um, following their injury. Okay, so that's my, my disclaimer. Um, so like I said before, you know, um, mental health, uh, when I say mental health, I mean emotions in general, right? I mean, where is our status, right? So we can have a good health status, we can have a poor health status, same thing with mental health. So the energy crisis of the brain changes the functioning in the brain. That includes our emotions, right? Like people seem to think for some reason that's not the case, but it is the case. Um, the diagnosis itself can be stressful depending on what you know about concussion and what you don't. If you know someone who's had one and how awful their experience was, or if you know someone who's had one and how great it was, but you feel different. Like there's all of these things around just being diagnosed with concussion. Um, any mood problems before concussion impacts recovery, pain and depression hang out together. So chronic pain in general, depression goes up the longer we have pain, right? So regardless of brain injury, uh, pain and depression hang out together. There's loose guidelines for recovery timeline, but we still kind of go, eh, I think it's this, but we don't really know. Um, and that can be really distressing to people who um, are in the injury, right? So if you think about you, you know, tear your ACL, you sprain your ankle, you uh, have a migraine, whatever, like you have an intervention that's going to help cut down the recovery time, or you know what the trajectory is. And yeah, it might, there was wiggle room in there, but you have kind of this, you understand. Um, when someone has a concussion and they say, you should be better in two weeks, which by the way, please don't say that. If you say that, I'm not a medical provider, but please say 30 days. Um, <laughs> should we be feeling better around 30 days? This is where we hope we start to see improvement. Um, but some people will say two weeks. As soon as someone is told you will be better in two weeks, and then in two weeks they are not better, it causes distress immediately. I should be better. It's two weeks. What's wrong? Da, da, da. Now my blood pressure's up. Now my stress is up. Now my mood goes down, right? And now I have more symptoms and I'm convinced that I'm unhelpful, right? It's a cycle here, right? So, so expectation is really important. Um, giving people understanding of timelines, like oh, 30 days is when people tend to start feeling better. It can last longer, but you know, we tend to see that happen. Um, and then, uh, when we're not given a lot of structure and we don't have someone like a psychologist or, um, any other provider who can help us understand where our symptoms are coming from or what options there are for that, we tend to relate it back to that injury. So I can't count, I can't 
count how many times I've heard, I never had these problems before my injury and how delicately I have to challenge that. So you never walked into your room and forgot something before your injury. That never happened. Well, I probably, right. And like, okay, yep. It's not to say that that doesn't happen and it's annoying and it hasn't increased. Right. But I also can't like, yeah, you did. Right. We all do that as part of being human. And so that's the delicate dance of how do I validate, but also not collude with there's this really broken part of you that no one can help you with. Um, part of my job as your psychologist is to help you maintain hope. And finding the things that you can uh, control and help yourself with. Um, so why don't mental health providers know more? Well, our training isn't medical. If you haven't been in a hospital setting, if you haven't been exposed to this stuff, like there's no reason that you should know about it. It's really unfortunate because there's actually a lot of reasons that we should know about it, but um, I think we'll get there eventually. A lot of people have limited experiences with concussion cases um, professionally, and the ones that they do tend to be the prolonged symptom ones that they don't know what to do with, that then they feel helpless about, they don't know what to do with, they feel like they can't, you know, it's, again, they're human, so it's a cycle there. I'm hearing misinformation in the media and not looking it up in research wise. And then they think whatever's in the media is accurate. I'll give you an example. So a uh, headline came out recently. I can't remember when. I'm not good at dates, but um, saying uh, NFL players at threefold increased risk of uh, CTE, developing CTE. Well, is that scary? Yeah, super scary. Until you look at the numbers and go, oh, wait, the threefold increases from 2% to 6%. So 94% of NFL players don't have CTE, right? But it's a media spin. That's what they do. That's their job. And our clients don't know that. So psychologists, mental health providers, if they don't look at it, they don't know it either. And so they think that that's what's happening. Um, there's a lot of fear. What if I give the person the wrong advice? What if I lead them in the wrong direction? Um, there's also personal experiences creeping into treatment um, that can be the basis of provider knowledge. So I share that I've had a concussion, like I said, um, so that people understand I've kind of been there, not in their shoes because every injury is different, but I understand the frustration. I understand kind of what it can feel like, but that's not why I'm doing the intervention I'm doing, or that's not why I'm, I'm talking to them the way I'm talking to them. The way that I am as a provider is because of my clinical background. Um, it's a complex injury. People don't like to not know what they're doing as providers. So if you think about, I don't have medical training. I haven't been exposed to it as much. When I read the research, it doesn't make sense to me. And it's a complex injury. Like these are all recipes for people who just don't want to treat people with concussions because it makes them feel uncomfortable and they're very scared of doing harm. Um, and so, yeah, it's hard to feel confident about treatment uh, when the research doesn't feel clear and medical professionals disagree. Um, so recently there was a, a concussion consensus group met um, in Amsterdam and they couldn't even agree on a definition of concussion. So like, we're not all on the same page. Uh, so I think that trickles down to, um, so how does treatment help with recovery? Well, education, if your provider knows about concussions, they can help you understand what it actually is. Um, and what is not um, emotional support, obviously somewhere to go just to complain and be mad about it and like be able to help you figure out like what's going on. What's my symptom pattern? When do I feel better or worse? What are the things that are making it harder? Um, what are the things that make my mood change? Um, how do I cope with that? And I want to be very clear when I talk about coping, I don't know what other providers mean, but when I talk about coping, I talk about how do I deal with a thing that's happening without making it worse? If it gets better, that's fantastic. But I just don't want to make it worse. Coping doesn't mean make it go away. Let's not make it worse. And if we can make it a little bit better, great, right? But like, like let's have some control over what's going on and acknowledge when we can't make it better. How do we just not make it worse? Uh, we can increase treatment adherence. So there are people who don't want to do their PT exercises. I know that's shocking. Um, OT exercises, you know, speech therapy exercises, like how do we support them to, to do what they need to do? Um, supporting them in self-advocacy, helping them with grief. So depending on what uh, their injury is, if they've lost something in the process, um, they may need to grieve whatever that is. Um, and then decision-making to improve quality of life. So are there ways that you need to prioritize your energy now in a new and different way? Um, and then how do we maintain hope?
Um, we may unintentionally increase helplessness and anxiety by invalidating. I talked about this earlier, like minimizing or over-validating, um, reinforcing false information. Oh, you have three concussions. You're probably going to get CTE. Um, that's not a thing. Misattribution of symptoms, right? So everything must be related to um, the concussion. It may be, but it may not be related to brain injury itself. Um, inpatients are lacking confidence um, in the provider themselves, like being impatient with the process of recovery or just lacking confidence in their ability to help. Um, failing to identify strengths. So people already are being told all the things that are going wrong with them, like what's going well or what are they good at? And then poor pacing of treatment. So trying to rush it and make people move faster than they need to. Um, so consider their education. This is like before you meet. Um, what do we, what do we need? Consider education. So master's versus doctorate. Um, I obviously have my doctorate, so I'm a little biased because that's my lens. Um, that doesn't mean there's not good master's level providers out there. Absolutely there are. Um, but I want people to understand there's differences. So two years of graduate school education for most master's uh, programs. Doctorate's five to six years of graduate education. Um, if we look at, if you find somebody and you're like, oh, they're a psychologist, they have their PsyD versus their PhD. The basic way that I describe this to people is PsyD is clinically focused in terms of training. So I'm going to go into my internship uh, or into my uh, practice after I graduate with, you know, a couple thousand hours of face-to-face -to -face time, if not, you know, up to, you know, two or three thousand of face-to-face -face time with, with clients. Um, PhD training isn't necessarily that high because they're more research focused. That doesn't mean they don't have clinical hours. They absolutely do. Um, it's just the focus of their training is a little bit different. Doctorate doesn't guarantee better treatment. It's just a different level of training. So we just want to be aware of that. Look at work experience. So if you have a master's level clinician and a doctor level clinician, and the master's level clinician has worked in a hospital setting with TBI, I may encourage you to just try them first instead of going to the doctorate who has no experience in a hospital setting or with anything like that, right? Because it's just a different perspective that you can't learn unless you've been in the setting itself. Um, and then look and see if they've worked with neurologists, sports medicine, um, neuropsychologists, anything like that. These are also things you can ask them, but if it's out there, that would be awesome. Okay, so what do you do when you meet? Ask them about their experience with concussions. Um, ask them any questions you have that would really impact if you wanna work with them or not, or figure out what they know. Um, make sure they're comfortable working with the treatment team if necessary. So um, if you want them talking to them and helping you with treatment and understanding what's going on, I would argue that if they don't ask to do that to begin with, might be something to think about, right? Because people who are familiar with concussion want to be involved with the treatment team if there is a treatment team. Um, share how much you want to focus on concussion. So just because I had a concussion and it's bothering me and I've got stuff going on, that may not be the focus of what I want to do. Um, I didn't put this on my other slide, but I'll, I'll show you kind of like pink flags that you might need to switch providers. Um, but if they're focusing more on the concussion than you are, that may be a pink flag because they may be stuck on the fact that you had a concussion and, and they're not getting. Like for you, that's not what your focus is, but it is part of your experience that you want to understand. Um, let them know if you have concerns about being in therapy or any past experiences in therapy. Um, tell them your goals for treatment and the key ingredients to make sure you like them. If you don't like your provider, concussion or no concussion, <laughs> treatment is not going to go well. <laughs> so if, if you don't like them, switch. <laughs> um, I have told people that straight up. They've come in my office like, listen, if after the first session, you don't feel like we gel, let me know. And I will try and help you find the right person because it is very important. You feel like you like them. You feel comfortable with them. Um, so uh, here's some pink, what I'm calling pink flags, which are things that may indicate you need to switch up providers, but may not. May just be things that when you hear, you might just want to kind of think about it. So if they tell you, yeah, I have limited experience with concussion. Okay. That doesn't mean you shouldn't necessarily work with them. It just means that um, you want to feel out if they are going to be part of the, if they're going to reach out to treatment team, how are they going to make sure that they are getting your needs met, even if they're not super experienced with concussion. Um, if they provide conflicting information. So both from session to session of things that they've said themselves, and also from your treatment team. Um, if they have, and now I say this is a pink flag and not a red flag because the conflicting information they have also depends on how good the information the treatment team has or the physician has. So I don't want to just outright say if they have conflicting information, that's a bad thing. Uh, if they talk about their personal experience with concussion, that can be a pink flag. You want to listen for how much they're talking about it. 
um, if it becomes about their concussion experience or if it's just like, oh yeah, like I know it can be really frustrating. They're not saying because I had a concussion, but they're like, oh, I know it can be super frustrating not to know. Like, and they're relating, but they're not making it about their experience. Uh, if they seem uncomfortable questions about concussions and mental health, um, so not being able to explain why you're anxious with all these things happening or uh, pay attention to their body language. So if there's a lot of shifting, I know, like I said, I'm moving right now because the lights are going to go off. Um, but if they're shifting a lot and they're seeing, or they kind of don't make eye contact or they just seem uncomfortable, pay attention to that. Um, like I said before, if they emphasize concussion more than you'd like, um, or don't incorporate it enough, that could be a pink flag. Um, and that's something that I would say, I would ask them about like, Hey, seems like you're talking about it a lot or you're not like, let's talk about that. Um, and then makes assumptions about your experience. So uh, not everyone who has a concussion deals with it poorly. So it's like, I feel like that sometimes is like, if they get to the mental health side of it, um, sometimes we just assume like, oh, you must be doing bad mental health wise. Like actually they might be doing fine. They just need a little more support in um, dealing with whatever it is they're dealing with related to their. These are red flags. Uh, see slide eight for this first one. If they reiterate any of the old ways of doing things, they are not up to date on their research. And I would just say, don't worry about it. <laughs> That's not your job to teach them the new research. Um, if there's disagreement with the treatment team um, or not consulting with them when necessary. So if they disagree with the treatment team and then don't want to consult, that's a red flag. Don't work with them. Because at that point, you as the patient are starting to try to have to do more work than is necessary. That is the psychologist or the therapist's job. And if they are not going to do it, do not do that for them. That's a red flag. Um, if they can't answer questions about concussion and mental health, like, well, and they only talk about circumstances, they don't talk about the injury itself. Um, that's a red flag. Um, if they use personal experiences as evidence, they're knowledgeable. So, oh, you have experience with concussions. Tell me about that. Well, I had a concussion. That is already like, nope, that's not, that's great that you're willing to share that and you can relate, but that's not necessarily going to mean that they're going to be able to give you that treatment that you need. And more than likely, they will not be able to um, because there's probably stuff there they haven't dealt with. Uh, and then describing concussions as a bruise to the brain, people still do this. So um, to me, that's a red flag. Other people might say it's a pink flag, but to me, it's a red flag because of all the things I've heard people who still are in that mindset is very old stuff. Um, People who think they're operating as a medical provider, when they're a psychologist or a mental health um, provider, they're not medically trained. So if they're kind of operating in that decision-making capacity um, in medicine, that's a red flag. Um, not understanding concussions do not mean you're going to develop CTE. Huge red flag. They start talking about concussions and CTE synonymously. That's not a good thing. Um, relying on social media for information. I know that sounds ridiculous, like, but... You ask them where they get their information and they start talking about they're getting it on, you know, these platforms. Just be mindful of that. Um, only know about concussions because I read an article about the NFL players. Like, that's a problem. Um, not open to feedback or challenging. So if you, if they disagree with your treatment team and you challenge them a little bit on it, how do they respond? If you consistently leave sessions not feeling heard or feeling worse than when you arrive, stop going to that person. <laughs> there are going to be sessions where you feel worse. That is 100% true of all psychotherapy. It should not be frequent, okay? So it might not be a good fish, fit. That doesn't necessarily mean you need to just ghost them. I want to bring it up, but, um, and then if you don't like them, again, red flag, you don't like them. It's not going to be good treatment for you. So. Go ahead and say your goodbyes. So. All right, so where do I start? Um, so for anybody looking for a therapist or mental health provider um, who knows concussion, you want to use these search terms, okay? Go online, search therapist, psychologist, concussion, use your location. Um, you may need to do psychotherapy or counseling. Um, that's a place to start. That doesn't mean it's gonna bring up the best people, but you're gonna start to see who has knowledge and see names in your area. Um, psychologytoday.com is a website that generally has a lot of different information on it. Not always the best or the most accurate. Sometimes people just say they do everything. So my recommendation is if you go to psychologytoday.com, there's an email me button, email them first and ask them some of the questions that I just mentioned. Um, local hospital systems often have concussion teams and programs that include psychologists. So rehab psychology, health psychology, those types of things. Um, and so local uh, hospital systems are a good place to start if you can. You can email me. 
um, or the Concussion Resource Center for any guidance that you may need. All right, so I kind of ran through that, but I knew we were kind of running short on time. So hopefully I didn't run over too much. All right. Okay, got it. All right. Comments, questions, concerns. Check it off mute so anybody has any questions or comments. That was a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> it was. So we'll have the um we'll get some of the slides and they'll be on our website. So if you guys want to review those, and then we'll also have the recording on the website too. So if you want to listen to it again and be able to see the slides a little bit closer. I'm sorry that the TV didn't work in here tonight. Um, that's disappointing. Um, but we'll have that information to be able to review and look over and use as a resource. Um, so Samantha will get those to me. Any questions? I thought that was a lot of great information. Um, and you know, I really appreciate the parts of kind of what to look for when you're looking for a, a counselor. Um, I have been on the Psychology Today website and just there's so many people out there, but how do I know if they have you know, experience in concussion? And I think that's a really important question um, when people do look for someone and, and not just, yes, I have, but even like how many people have you treated and what's your background, what's your um, continuing education that you've completed um, specifically on concussion. And we do have several therapists in town in Bozeman who have that experience, which has been great, that have a passion. Yeah. I've done um, some additional training in that area. Any questions? Or... I have a question. What have been your experience with like family members or caregivers and how do you best provide support to them as well? Yeah, a really good question. So um, I think I want to ask a clarifying question. So in terms of how to support the client or give them information? If you don't have a specific question, that's okay. I just yeah, want to make sure. For example, like I have a kiddo who's just turned 18 and she had a concussion when she was earlier, like a way younger, but still affecting kind of her relationship even with her mom, like how she is processing into this like adulthood era. So like, I don't know, addressing something like that, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so, so I would say like, um, First, there's the aspects of like, what does mom understand about the injury and their pre-existing relationship, which can be challenging. Um, I've seen a lot of pretty, I'll use the word unpleasant, uh, <laughs> parent-child relationships um, that uh, have actually led to prolonged symptoms because we were in denial or assuming they're, we were exaggerating because we didn't want to go to school or whatever. Um, so I would say, you know, lots of information. There are some like family support sites and kind of understanding um, what they need. Um, but in general, I would say it's kind of case by case because I really would do an evaluation around like what is the relationship between the family members. Um, and that would kind of guide how I would intervene with them. Um, because a lot of times because it's invisible, whatever the pre-existing relationship is the lens through which the parent is interpreting the symptoms. And so there can be a lot of projection that happens um, or if they feel helpless, like think about providers. Sometimes we feel like, oh my gosh, like what we're doing is like, it's working, but it's so slow. It's not like, it's, you're not getting. And so sometimes what I'll see is parents get so distressed by their kids being distressed that they actually are angry with their children or they get very impatient. And then they start to get like, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you feeling better? You're, you know, and they start to kind of pick at them. Um, and so I, I do education and I encourage you guys to do education as well around the stress of the family system being really important to recovery. Um, and that if there are stressors that the mom or dad are feeling around um, the injury itself, that they need to get their own support as well, because it's very important that they feel supported at home. Does that answer your question? I know it's kind of like a not answer answer, but. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Do you ever have the same experience with spouses? I was just about to say the same thing. So my husband has had like seven concussions and definitely still affects him. And I was just thinking that as you gave that response, how do you Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 
I haven't with spouses in terms of concussion. I have with like moderate to severe brain injury. Um, but I do work with people who have chronic illness and disabilities all the time. Um, and I work and I'll have them bring their spouses in and we talk about what we're working on. Um, I mean, I talk to my clients first. <laughs> and so we agree on like what needs, what can be disclosed. Um, but what we're working on, kind of how they can support. Again, I think with spouses, there's also this element of you look fine or you're not getting better. I'm frustrated and feeling helpless. And so then again, they kind of are upset with the person who's injured or, or has a disability depending on the situation because they feel like they don't have any say or what to do with that. And so I find that in my work, bringing people into the room and just having them there to explain what we're doing and what's going on and how they can help that actually eases a lot of the tension in the relationship because they help they know where they stand if that makes sense um but i also think that there's caregivers need to take care of themselves and that's a lot of what we did on the inpatient unit was making sure that people understood it was okay to be frustrated about being a caregiver it was okay to be frustrated with the process like all of these things are natural and okay to be annoyed with and the person experiencing it is feeling all those things too and so you can't put it on that person right like you wouldn't go to someone with cancer and complain to them about how their cancer is annoying like that's not that's not a thing so like don't do that with concussion either you need to go to you know someone yourself and get your own support make sure you're getting taken care of as well important part. I think there was a good point there too. I think often when we've had client spouses come into our therapy sessions, speech, OT, PT, and then they can see what we're really working on, et cetera. And that really can help them understand a little bit more too. It's that thing if you look fine, but then we put them through the, the, the paces and see how they're doing. Then they can, you know, spouses often are like, oh, I didn't realize that. So I think that's really important to, to include those spouses and caregivers, et cetera, too. But the other part of I'm always saying, you know, you need to take care of yourself too. Um, and not just counseling, but also time for yourself, doing your activities, you working out, you having time to do the things you need instead of just being the caregiver um, solely. So, yeah, and like the loss that can sometimes be felt there when the person who is injured can't do the things that maybe they used to share doing with their spouse, that can sometimes get in the way of the spouse doing their own, the things they enjoy because, like, well, we used to do it together. And so. Yeah. Sure. It's it's important to be able to identify that. Yeah. Exactly. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. 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 I know I ran through that really fast. I'm sorry if I spoke too quickly. I was trying to make sure I didn't, I didn't exactly. run over. Did you slow down. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of information, but I know when I present, I tend to speak quickly too. That's what the record button is for. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can all listen to it again. I do have a exactly. question. Exactly. Um, you describe the concussion as an energy crisis in the brain. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so so the actual concussion injury itself is at the molecular level. So it's there is um, strain on right our, our axons um, and and the synapses in the brain are moving around. They're not breaking necessarily. Some might, but that's not necessarily the issue. The issue is that there's increased stress and, and with the changing um, physiology of the brain um, that creates permeability. And so there's an influx in, uh, of things going into the cell that don't need to be and things coming out of the cell that don't need to be. And like, there's just, an, and it creates an energy crisis where that's why rest the first two days is so important because we're actually um, trying to decrease your brain doing, it's not like, oh, you need to shut your brain off. That's not, right, that's not a thing. But like, it's, it's minimizing the energy we're using anywhere else so that our brain can start to recover and come back to that homeostasis and heal. Um, but that energy crisis peaks. So it takes about 24 hours for it to peak. Um, which is why we say in sports to remove somebody immediately, don't let them return to play for a period of time, because if there's an injury, they're more likely to be injured because their brain's already trying to get that energy crisis under control. Um, and so all of that can cause various symptoms, which can be headaches, um, mood instability, but, uh, dizziness, balance, just depending on wherever that injury is. And I mean, mild, mild uh, injury is more. Uh, uh, of the like diffuse injury, right? So it's going to impact all sorts of stuff. Does that answer your question? Was that specific enough? 
There's a handout too that we have on our website, and I can send it to you too. That uh, okay. about understanding concussion, Samantha. That I think that just that first page it kind of under, talks about the chemical imbalance and just how it can't be reabsorbed. Those chemicals and kind of floating that takes energy, and the blood flow is less than it, what it normally is. So just kind of how that functioning is is happening. And so the and chemicals they're hormonal. Are they stress hormones? Or a different chemical, like it's not the adrenaline cortisol. It's not the adrenaline, no. It's just, and the way I think about it is like, um, this is going to be really kind of silly, but the way I think about it is like, um, like a hose that gets punctured, and then like stuff is like water is going to be coming out, and things aren't getting like as. But think of it the other way too. So almost like water is coming out, but now other stuff is getting in that shouldn't be, and so you have stuff that's leaving the cell and stuff that's going in. It's it's like sodium potassium, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, glutamate, like all of those. Um, and then uh, because of that, like the uh, ATP production is is impacted and things like that. And it's just as, yeah, the brain's not working as efficiently and all this extra. And it takes more energy then to get those those chemicals in, back to where they need to be. And that's why a lot of fatigue is, is a huge thing, how tired people are, it's because the brain is working harder. So yeah, and people think, well, my brain's not working as well, but it's usually that it's working overtime. It's working harder to try to do the basic things that they used to do. And that's a lot of what fatigue is going on. There's some things Which like is functional MRIs that just actually show that the brain is lighting up even more after concussion because it doesn't know quite what is the most specific area that could be used for that task. And it's just trying to figure out, you know, what what part of the brain needs to work. So that's a lot of other reasons a lot of that fatigue. And even later on, not necessarily just that first 24 hours for that, that part of it, but. Um, yeah. Which is also why you have decreased attention and you'll have the subjective report of I'm feeling different, right? Or like I'm doing things slower, but like objectively they don't look like they are just because the brain isn't firing efficiently. Other questions? And if you guys have questions later, Kathy has my email. I'm happy to be in touch with people. like whatever support I can be. I'm happy to do that. That's Beth has actually offered to um, like when we get resources of people calling the resource center that if it's, if I feel it's more of a psychological or whatever, that she's happy to talk to them and kind of screen that and give them some of that information of what to look out for, et cetera, which would be great part of our, our services and our, our team of what we can do through the resource center. Which I appreciate that. Samantha, thank you. Yeah, of course. Anything else? Well, well thank you guys for having me. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks for taking time out to do this. Um, really yeah. good. We'll, we'll be in touch. Um, anything else? But we'll we'll get this on the, the website soon and, and be able to access it. And, and, uh, you can send me your PowerPoint if you don't mind. Um, so yeah, I'll send you that and I'll send you a bio. To, <laughs> sorry about that. That's fine. The bio, yeah, it was more to introduce you. So, oh, you I did, did it myself. <laughs> so, okay, perfect. Great. Thanks. So much. All right. Thank you guys so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, guys.